All right. Open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Going to spend our time there today. Philippians chapter 2. And of course, I already read part of this. But we're going to take a look at a larger section of the text. While you're doing that, I want to warn you, I have not practiced this sermon. I have no idea how long it is. God gave it to me yesterday afternoon, and in the evening, I finally had time to come to the church and figure out if that's what God wanted me to do, and he said yes, and so I wrote it, and, and here we are. But at least he gave me last night to work on it. <laughs> he didn't give it to me this morning. All right, Philippians chapter 2. So I'm going to take an eye on the clock here and make sure that we don't go over here. All right, start in verse 6. Though he was God, talking about Jesus, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. When Jesus came to earth, what did that entail? Well, first of all, let's take a look at verse 6. Though he was God. The, the word for was, many of your translations will probably say form, in the form of God. It, it kind of depends on how they translate it. The word there is morphe, or morphe, excuse me. And morphe means a shape or, figuratively, an inner nature. In other words, there are words for a shape, like I'm going to make this in the shape of a goose. Take this paper, make it in the shape of a goose. Okay, that's one word. I don't remember what it is. I didn't write it down. Morphe is not that kind of form or shape. It means the inside of you, the, the nature of, that you have that makes your outward form become what it is. For example, if you are a nice person on the inside, that makes its way to the outside, and then that is your shape or form, if you will. Although it's, it's, it's sometimes used uh, as a fig- physical form, but it's also used figuratively, as your inner nature. So Jesus wasn't in the shape of God. We are created in the shape of God. Jesus was in very nature God. So so he's God, okay? And then it says, he did not demand and cling to his righteous God. Does anyone have the King James? What does it say for their cling He did not consider, I think I've got it here, what does it say? It says, no, that's that's later on in verse 6, robbery. He did not think it robbery. I remember when I when I was reading, I'm, you know, I, I checked different versions and stuff like that, and I, I got to that word in the King James and went, robbery? What on earth? So I looked up the Greek word, because I can, because I have cool software. And the Greek word for robbery, I'm not going to read it to you because I cannot pronounce it, uh, is translated cling or to hold on to. It literally means to plunder or to clinging with covetousness. In other words, holding on to something that shouldn't be yours. That's why they use the word robbery in the King James. So here, Paul is saying that Jesus, though he was God, did not hold on to, like a little child holding on to his toy, his rights as God. So think about that. He did not say... No, you can't make me human, because if I'm human, I can't be me. I'm going to hold on to me, to my godness, to my rights as God, so I can't become human. He didn't do that. He did not, what does it say in the New Living? He did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Look at verse 7. He made himself nothing in the New Living Translation. And the King King James, it says he emptied himself. Or no, I'm sorry, it says he took himself, made himself of no reputation. I believe the New Living, or the New International says he emptied himself. The Greek word there is fascinating. It means to abase. Do you guys know what that means? To abase. Uh, To, let me just read the other ones. They'll make make it understand better. Uh, To neutralize. Okay, so to make of no effect. It can also be translated to falsify or to negate. To abase would be like to make it lower than it was. Okay? So he made himself nothing compared to what he was before. You see, he was God, but he didn't think, 
man, I don't want to give up being God, because this is a pretty sweet deal, being God. He didn't think that. He just said, I'm going to become nothing. And not just a human nothing. He became a nothing compared to humans. What did he do with the disciples? Wash the disciples' feet? He told them, I did not come to be served, but to serve. He didn't even come down as a king of humans. He came down as a slave. In fact, it says that in the next verse. He made himself nothing. Verse 7, he took the humble position of a slave. That word there means slave. It means someone who is in servitude, whether voluntary or not. And then appeared in human form. He gave up his divine relationship with the Father. Now, you may say, well, no, Pastor, he didn't because he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he spent time, you know, he says, I know what the Father says and what he does and all that. Yes, but what happened on the cross? He took all our sins and God has nothing to do with sin. The Father had to turn his back on his own son. Separation between himself and himself. He also gave up all the riches of heaven. I mean, you know, it'd be one thing to come down from heaven to today where we've got all kinds of cool stuff. But, you know, back then it was pretty rough living, especially if you weren't a king. And he wasn't an earthly king. He also gave up his glory. I love it. I heard someone speak on this once, and he said, if Jesus had come down in his full glory, the world would have worshipped him. But they would have died in their sins. Jesus had to come down without his glory so that he could die for us, so we could live. So he left his glory in heaven. And I like this one. He gave up his independent exercise of authority. His independent exercise of authority. Think about that for a minute. Jesus in heaven, as God, can do whatever he wants. But when he came down to earth, he said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I see the Father, or hear the Father saying. You know, I'm not my own master. He submitted himself to the Father. Now, he is the Father, so I don't know how that works, but somehow, you know, <laughs> somehow he gave up his ind independent exercise of authority. And then the word there, made himself a slave, in the, in the Greek it actually has the word morphe there again, he made himself in the form of a slave, became human, and then look in verse 8. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further, by dying a criminal's death on a cross. Now, I want to look at two things here. First of all, he humbled himself. The word for humble, I don't have the actual Greek word here. Um, maybe I have it someplace else, but I don't have it in this point in the notes. Means, it was, it was a term for uh, rivers. Uh, you know how, you know, you got a river that's running in the spring and it's all full of water and stuff, and then the fall comes and it gets lower and lower and lower until there ain't nothing in there anymore? As it got lower and lower and lower, the word that for in the Greek was originally used, that was a humbled river. It was brought low. It wasn't the word humble, obviously. It was some word in the Greek that I can't pronounce. But uh, that's what that word literally meant, to be brought low. And so they began to use it to describe individuals who were brought low in their status. For example, if, uh, if you were a rich man and you lost all of your money in a bad venture, you were brought low, you were humbled, you were made lower than you were before. Um, if you were a proud person and somebody just completely, you know, uh, uh, humiliated you in front of everybody, you were brought low, you were made lower than you were before. And so Jesus here, it says that he humbled himself. Now, there's something interesting about the Greek word for humble that I want to share with you. In Greece, during, you know, Jesus' time, in ancient Greece, the word humble was not a good word. You know, you know how we use the word humiliate? Humiliate has a negative connotation. Humble doesn't anymore because we have Christian roots. But in Greece, they didn't have Christian roots. Being humble was a bad thing. You always wanted to exalt yourself and make yourself better. You wanted to raise yourself. You don't want to lower yourself. To be humble was an insult. And so it says here that he made himself lower than he was. He humbled himself. And then it says, in obedience, he obediently humbled himself. You know, humility... True humility always is followed with obedience. 
Disobedience is nothing more than saying, I'm better than you. That's all it is. That's the root of disobedience. And so anytime God says, do this and you don't, or he says, don't do this and you do, you have exalted yourself above God and said, I know better than you. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, Pastor, no, come on now. I sinned yesterday, and there was no thought in my head that I'm better than God. Well, it's not in your head. It's in your heart. It happens in here. It is part of the sin nature of our flesh to exalt ourselves above everything we see, everything we have, everything that we interact with, whether it's a person or an animal. Uh, my bird has not liked the move because we're hanging him from a hook on the ceiling. So he's like way up here. He doesn't like that. And so he's been peeping a lot more. He makes a really loud peep when he's unhappy. He voices himself. He's a howry, I guess. Um, and so when he gets unruly, I don't have the spray bottle anymore. I can't find the spray bottle I used to spray him with when he would peep. So I don't have anything, any way to stop him. So I stick him in the broom closet. Isolation treatment, birdie. And then you forget he's there for like four hours. No, it's not that bad. Uh, but he, uh, I want to exalt myself over this stupid bird. I want to control him because I don't like him peeping. I don't know why. I have yet to figure out why. It's probably some deep psychological impact of my, my, my mother when I was a small child. I don't know. But anyway, it irritates me, and I want to control it. You laugh. You laugh. You've done it too, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> I can't blame my mother's. That would be mean. Uh, I didn't say it was her fault. I said it was some thing to do with her. Okay, anyway. She doesn't watch these, does she, Mom? You're not watching. Okay. Um, where was I? Oh, humbling yourself. Thank you. When we humble ourselves, we go contrary to our very nature. Now, not our new nature in Christ. Our new nature in Christ desires to humble itself. It is humble before the Lord. But our flesh nature is not. It does not want to be humble. It wants to be exalted. And so when we disobey, we are exalting ourselves rather than humbling ourselves because obedience always follows humility. It just it, You can't help it. And you know, the obedience that Jesus had wasn't just the simple obedience that Jesus usually asks of the average American Christian. It was obedience to death. And not just any death. A criminal's death. Jesus was the only non-criminal on the planet who had lived and who will ever live. And yet he died a criminal's death. Have you ever been blamed for something you didn't do? How irritating is that? I love it, <laughs> you know, when it happens with my children, not because I'm cruel, but it's really funny to watch their reactions because they, they get so, but I didn't do it. Students did the same thing. This is not my fault. And yet Jesus was obedient even to a criminal's death on the cross. He didn't get up on the cross and say, you guys don't know what you're doing. I'm innocent. Good grief. Think about this for a minute. I'm God. Get me off of this. <laughs> He didn't do that. He was obedient unto death for something he didn't do. And he died not just a criminal's death, but a crucifixion. One of the most torturous deaths ever invented by humankind. That describes what Jesus did when he came to earth. But what's the context? I mean, it's... It's important that we understand what Jesus did. But really, what are we talking about? What, what is Paul discussing? Well, let's go up just a little bit. Instead of continuing on to verse 9, let's go to verse 5. Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. No, I could not have read that, right? Let's take a look. Let's read it from the King James. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Is that what that really says? Anyone have anything that does not say you should be like Jesus? Because I don't like that. I don't like the thought of having to make myself low and be obedient even unto death. Anybody like that idea? Does that sound pleasant to anyone? Of course not. It goes against our very nature. And yet this is what Paul is saying. He told us what Jesus went through. He told us what Jesus did in the context of saying, this is how you should be. 
You should be like Jesus. Well, what does that mean? That means that we should, even though we, we're not God, so we don't have the rights as God, but we have rights as human beings, right? I mean, we're Americans. We have rights. We don't get to cling to our rights, whether it's American or humanity or a child of God or whatever. We don't get to cling to our rights, but rather we should empty ourselves and humble ourselves to the point of obedience. Go up to verse 3. Let's read this whole section. Do not be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble. What was that word again? Does anybody remember what it means? Brought low. Be low. How low can you go? Think about that for just a minute. You know, I always tell people and I always say that humility isn't about thinking bad of yourself. Oh, Tim's not here. I was so going to make fun of him today. Oh, well. Jared, you're here. It's your birthday tomorrow. Come here. I'm not actually going to make fun of you. Good, you're taller than me. I thought you were. All right. Jared, if I had my docs on, I don't think you'd be quite as tall as me. Jared is taller than me, right? Now... Squat down so that you're not taller than me. Okay, now Jared has made himself lower than me. Okay, does that mean that Jared is of any less value? No, let's use it this way. Is Jared, can you do this for a little while? Okay, get back up. <laughs> That's right. He's getting old. I can't do this for long. Uh, does Jared lose any weight when he gets down? You wish, don't you? <laughs> That's right. No, he doesn't. Now, I want you to get down on your knees over here next to Marge and get lower than Marge's head, okay? You getting this on the camera, honey? Okay. Now, oh, you got to get lower. There we go. Okay. Now, Jared is lower than Marge. Is he of any less weight than he was before? No, he weighs the same. You can go sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, why did I show you that? Because when we humble ourselves, our natural flesh way to humble ourselves is to think worse of ourselves. That is not humbling. You're still thinking about you. When you humble yourselves, you make yourselves of less importance than others. One of there's two ways to do that. You can make yourself lower or you can make them higher. You see, the trick is found here in the text. Let's look at it here. Uh, be humble. This is verse 3. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now, it doesn't say thinking badly about yourself. It says thinking of others as better than yourselves. Rather than bringing yourself down to humble yourselves, you bring others up. You think of them as more important than you. That's what Jesus did. When he came to the earth, he didn't say, you know, you guys are a bunch of jerks. Think about his apostles. What a bunch of idiots. I mean, these guys were dense. He didn't say, you know what, forget you guys. Go on. I'm going to do my own thing. You guys are not worth it. Well, they weren't worth it. But he thought of them as more important than himself. He gave his own life for them. You don't give your life for someone you don't think that's more important than you. We should have the same attitude of exalting others above where we are. So rather than squashing yourself down, which doesn't work, by the way, you bring others up. Now, this should always be our attitude. Humility should be our constant companion. But, what's the context? What is Paul talking about here? Well, let's take a look at verse 2, which I don't have on my notes. What on earth? I start in verse 3. Okay, who has verse 2? Somebody wants to read it. Right. Paul's saying, look, make me happy by being united. The context of Jesus' sacrifice for you was so that you would have the same attitude of humility. Your attitude of humility is in the context of being unified in a church. 
So what's he talking about? Why did he mention Jesus Christ's hum, um, humbling experience of death on a cross? So that we could be one. He didn't say it so that you could get some spiritual revelation of how much Jesus suffered. He didn't do it so that you could understand humility better. He did it so that you could be one with the person sitting next to you. Harold's like, no one's sitting next to me. <laughs> then, you, then you're okay, I guess. The context was unity. Why do we fail in unity? Why? What is so hard about being unified? Well, first of all, it goes against our very nature. You can't be unified if you're not humble. You're like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a very humble person, but I'm unified with people. No, you're not. You're using them. I'm sorry, folks, that's the God's honest truth. A proud person does not unify with someone else. They use them for their benefit. How many marriages have I seen where one spouse is using the other spouse for their benefit? How many young couples have I seen where they're both using each other? They don't understand because they've never been taught that it's about the other person, not you. We fail in unity because it goes, it's counterintuitive, it's contrary to our nature. But like I always say, if you want different results in the world, or different results than you've been getting, try a different tact. Another problem, or I think at least the root of the problem, is fear. We're afraid. We're afraid that if we bring ourselves low, we're going to lose. I mean, think about it. If you, if you make yourself low, other people might walk all over you. Other people might abuse you. They might use you. They might hurt you. You, you. You'll lose your rights. You'll lose your advantages. You'll lose your place. Isn't that what the Pharisees were concerned about? I mean, they, you know, the uh, uh, Jesus. There's, I think it was right after Lazarus was raised from the dead, and they say, you know, what are we going to do if this keeps up? We're going to lose our kingdom and our place. They were proud. They weren't humble. They weren't thinking of others as better than themselves. They were thinking about themselves. And, you know, it's a fear that we have that we will lose if we humble ourselves. And there's some legitimacy to that. Look what happened to Jesus. He humbled himself and got executed. He humbled himself and people spat on him and hated him and beat him up. And betrayed him. One of his own disciples betrayed him. Yes, if you humble... You might lose some of those things. But hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. The next question I want to ask is this. Why is it so important? I mean, really, Micah, why is it so important that we humble ourselves and be unified? What's the big deal about unity? I mean, can't we just come to church on Sunday morning, have a good worship service, hear a good sermon, and go home? Why can't we do that? I'll give you a few reasons. Unity... When we are unified, we fulfill Jesus' request in John chapter 17 that we live in unity. He prayed, Father, that they may be one just as we are one. That was for you. He specifically said, this is not just for them. This is for everybody that will believe. If you're a believer, he's talking about you. He wants you to be unified with other believers. That's what he wants. So when we are unified, we fulfill the request of Jesus. Also in John chapter 13, Jesus said that the whole world will know that you're my disciples when you love each other. That's unity. We can not only prove to the world that we are his disciples, we can prove to the world that he's real. Try to find unity in the rest of the world. You know, I watched a video uh, the other day about, uh, uh, well, I won't give you the details, but they were talking about Nazi Germany and how, how unified the country was. You know, that country was not unified. You know how I know it wasn't unified? Because as soon as the Third Reich fell, they, pfft, they fell apart. They were held together with false glue. You know what that glue was? I'm the master race. I'm better than everybody else. Pride. Pride held them together until they were proved wrong, and then they fell apart. Humility doesn't fall apart. Partially because it's true. <laughs> Pride is a lie. You want true unity? You want to prove to the world that Jesus Christ is real? Be unified with each other. Not only that, unity gives us more power, more strength, 
and specifically more authority over the enemy. I'm going to try it. I didn't write down the, I wrote down the references. If you're taking notes, you might jot them down. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 25. Um, I can't remember that what that one was. I knew that was going to happen. I knew I should have written something down. Anyway, look that one up. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. That's right before the, uh, uh, the dissension and the baptism of the Spirit. Jesus said, wait until you receive power from on high. What was going on right before that? They were all in one accord. Not only that, it pleases the Father. Romans chapter 14, verse 18. Now, are you still in Philippians? Go to verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. I want to show you the rest of this. Because of this, because of Jesus' humble obedience, because of this, God raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name that is above every other name. Now, let's stop there and think about that for a second. Uh, how many of you have highly exalted? A couple of you? Okay. Um, do you know what that word means in the Greek? It's a really funny word. It's it's an impossible word. It's a it's a, a ridiculous word. It's a word that describes something that's impossible. It means exalted above the most exalted, super exalted, uber exalted. This is this is the exalted that is so high that nothing could be exalted above it because it's above the highest level of exaltation. That's what it means in the Greek. All of that, you know, they would have to talk for a long time. To, no, I'm kidding. He was exalted higher than you can be exalted because of his humble obedience. But not just that. He was given a name above every other name. And I remember somebody, I remember somebody teaching on this. He said, no, what, what was that name? Some people think it was this. Some people think it was this. He said, I think it was Jesus. His name stayed the same. It just got that much more important. You remember the sons of Sceva who were going around casting out demons even though they didn't know Jesus? And they come and they said, you know, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of him. And the demon said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And he beat him up. The name of Jesus is revered even among the demons. His name is exalted above every name. You know, in Hollywood, they do a lot of name dropping. Well, I know so-and-so and I had dinner with so-and-so and so-and-so called me and told me this. And, you know, they're always saying how, how important they are, making themselves more important. I don't have to worry about that. I know Jesus. His name's above all of them names. Brad Pitt? Psh, I know Jesus. Brad Pitt didn't raise from the dead. Even Jim Caviezel didn't raise from the dead. That was a camera trick. He's the guy who played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> because of this, what can humble unity do for you? It can exalt you. That's what it is. Mark chapter uh, 3, verses 25 is uh, the, the one who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I knew I'd remember it. You know, we all want to be exalted. You got to go around the back door, though. You got to humble yourself first. That's what Jesus did. He humbled himself and was obedient. He made himself of less value and importance than other people. And then he was exalted above everybody. The other day, I had a, uh, uh, a conversation with a former student of mine on Facebook. And she, uh, she's not married, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and she was complaining about men, so I felt the need to chime in. And she was asking why men are such jerks. And in my response, we began a conversation about marriage. Now, of course, I've been married for 17 years. I know that's nothing for you know a lot of you in... The congregation, like, 17 years, whatever. But, you know, for me, that's a long time. And uh, I remember there was another individual that kept chiming in in this conversation. It was a very long thread. The posts were really long, and we're all chatting about it. And, I, and she asked, why do marriages fail? And she was going to say, because people fall out of love. I could tell where she was going. You know, people love each other for a while, but then eventually love doesn't last. And then you got to divorce each other and find someone that you do love so you can put up with them. And I said, no, no. The reason marriages fail is because one or more parties, and it's usually more, one or more parties is selfish. Now, I'm sorry if you've been divorced. I don't, I'm not trying to insult you. Some of you have been divorced know exactly what I'm talking about. The reason marriages fail is because one or more people are selfish. They want what they want. 
They think they are better or more important than the other person. You get two people who think the other person is better than them, you know what will happen? They'll stay married forever and you'll be blissfully happy. What do you think's going on in my marriage? Good grief, I swear my wife is awesome. I mean, she's got her faults, but I can say this because she's not here. Uh, no, wait, that's backwards. Um, I love my wife. She's wonderful. And I exalt her above myself. Not above God, but above myself. And I treat her as more important than me most of the time. Not all of the time, obviously, still being human. And she does the same for me. Did we always do that? No. No. It took us many years to figure out how that works. And I got all these people that are coming to me on Facebook. Uh, I got a lot of former students that are married now. I got friends that are married and they're all having problems. My best friend in high school got divorced a few years ago. And what shocked me so much about it was he didn't care. That's ah, okay. It means I'm single now. I knew you were selfish, but holy cow. Think about that for a minute. Why do marriages split? Because of selfishness, because of pride, because of a lack of humbleness. In fact, let me just throw this at you. Every interpersonal conflict is a problem of pride. Every interpersonal conflict is a result of a lack of humility. All of them. Now, it could be one side, it could be both sides, but all of them have a lack of humility involved because if you were truly humble in a perfect situation, if both parties were perfectly humble, there would be no conflict. We would always be deferring to the other person. Of course, it might also be like a four-way stop in Kansas where there's four cars waving at each other to go. But, you know, I mean, when we put other people above ourselves, conflicts dissolve. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, I know someone who needs to hear this. Take it to heart for yourself. If you can learn how to do this, and it's not easy, and some of you think you can do it, but you can't. Because for the last, what are we talking, maybe 6,000 years, humanity's got it wrong. They've misunderstood humility. Jesus came... 2,000 years ago, and showed him how it worked. Do you think Jesus thought he was a worthless person? No, he knew he was the Son of God. He knew he was more valuable than every living being on the planet combined. But did he live that way? No. When he wanted time with himself and his Father and the crowd showed up, what did he do? He taught him and he healed him. When he wanted time alone with his disciples and everyone came to him with sick people, what did he do? He healed them. When someone dug a hole in his roof, and lowered a person down. Did he say, you're going to pay for that? No, he healed him. It wasn't as rough, but you know. Jesus was better than you, is better than you, and humbled himself below you. You are not better than each other, and yet we exalt ourselves above each other. If you can learn how to do it, your life will be so much better. Not just because interpersonal conflict will start to dissolve, but because of what happens when we humble ourselves. We get exalted. And it's not uncomfortable. It's not the kind where I try to be humble, but everyone just keeps talking about how wonderful I am. No, it's not like that. It's exalted in the eyes of God. I was at the conference yesterday, and, and one of the, he was talking about ministering to men, and, and he said, you know, John the Baptist, according to God's own word, was great in the eyes of the Lord. Are you great in the eyes of the Lord? He loves you. He loves you dearly and desperately. But are you great in his eyes? How do you get great in his eyes? You make yourself low. So Jesus did. He made himself low. And if he can do that for you, someone who is worth a lot less than him, can you do it for your fellow man? Can you do it for your fellow church member? I want everyone to close their eyes for a second. And just imagine, what could God do with this group of people if we humbled ourselves? What could he do? My God, can you see it? The, the power that could come through your hands and your voice. 
the people that you know in his community, put, them, put their face in front of your mind's eye. The people that need Jesus. Hashi is a great town, but there's a lot of people here who need Jesus. What could you do for them with the power of God when you humble yourself? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your example through Jesus. Thank you that through him we can see how it works. It's not easy, Lord. It's very hard. But you've given us strength through your spirit. You've given us the life inside of us that Jesus had. Show us how to work with that power and not our own strength. To humble ourselves the way Jesus did. To treat others as more important than ourselves. To give up our lives for others that we might see your glory. Father, forgive us for our pride. Forgive me, Lord, as much as anyone else. Forgive us when we look down on others instead of up to them. And purify our hearts. Touch these lips that have spoken evil about others with a hot coal and purify it. Place your hand on our heart and wash away the guilt of our pride. And then fill us with the love that Jesus had for us. That we can go away from this place and share that humble love. Thank you, Lord, that we know that when we pray according to your will, you hear us, and when you hear us, you answer our prayers. Help us to wait patiently and expectantly for it. In Jesus' name, amen.